Would you turn with me to the 22nd chapter of Luke? As we continue, we're actually uh, going to spend one more week in the same passage that we read last week. So let me read that again with you, Luke 22, beginning in verse 31. Jesus says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me, deny three times that you know me. Let me ask you a question introducing a sermon I've called a providential masterpiece this morning. Why were you saved? I think most of us answer to go to heaven, right? That's the thing that was of most interest to me when I came to Christ, and I suspect for many of us that would be the case. We would say, I was saved so that I could go to heaven. And that is certainly a, re- a wonderful result of having faith in Christ. But that is not the ultimate reason that we have been saved. That's found in Ephesians chapter 2, where we find in verses 8 and 9 that Paul defines how we are saved by grace through faith, not of works, right? Great passage to help us understand that. But then he goes right on in verse 10 and he says, for we are his Workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for, get in heaven? That's not what it says. We're created in Christ Jesus for good works. Good works. We are saved to live holy lives to the glory of the God who saved us. The words there We are his workmanship. His is emphatic. You could read it this way. Of him, we are a workmanship. He's creating something new in us. We are a workmanship created for good works. The word workmanship there is the Greek word poema. It means a making, a creation, something crafted. We are a making of God for the purpose of producing something, good works. The word by the time that Paul wrote Ephesians 2 had come to mean a work of art. And so what the Bible is saying there is I've, I've, I've been saved so that God could create in me a, this dazzling, beautiful work of art that would represent him by means of the works that are going on in my life to the glory of God. It turns out I'm saved not so much for me as I'm saved for God. God is always the focal point. He is, in essence, creating of all of us a masterpiece. Now, if you're like me, and I assume that you are somewhat, you probably don't, this morning, feel much like a masterpiece. As I look over the week I've been through, I say, hmm, a lot of sloppiness to that masterpiece this last week. A lot of things I'd like to change. A lot of ways I would do something differently. Don't feel like a masterpiece. We remind us of, uh, I remind myself of, of, there was an old uh, Philadelphia Phillies announcer, Harry Callis, very famous. I think he's in the Hall of Fame, and I think he's also not alive anymore, but very, very uh, revered by the people in Philadelphia as the Philly announcer for years. And he said this one time, introducing Gary Maddox, the outfielder. He said, Gary has turned his life around. He said he used to be depressed and miserable. Now, he's miserable and depressed. He got it turned around. I think a lot of us would say, as we look at our lives, 
That's what's happened. My efforts to turn myself around have resulted in I'm no longer, no longer miserable and depressed. Now I'm depressed and miserable, right? It seems like we haven't gotten very far. But in case you're feeling that way this morning, I want you to know that you are exactly the raw material that God is looking for. You're exactly the kind of person that he wants to make something great out of. You know, if it takes an artisan to take a piece of Italian marble, like Michelangelo did, and turn it into a statue of David, this great masterpiece, imagine what it takes to to take something, a piece of junk from the junkyard, and turn that into some artistic masterpiece. But that is exactly what God is up to. It's his specialty, making masterpieces out of messes. If you feel like your life is a mess, God wants to do something with that. I'll tell you what else. God will take every good and every bad and even every sinful part of your background and use that in creating that masterpiece wherever he finds a repentant heart. Wherever he finds a repentant heart. Most of you probably watch those uh, Home and Garden channel. You know, whenever uh, whenever I hear those going on upstairs above my office, I know Patty's ironing and she's watching HG channel to see all these old houses turned into things of beauty, right? Once in a while I get dragged into one of those. I'm done with it because we spent 13 years doing that with the first house that we owned together. But they take these and they turn them into things of beauty But let me tell you, beloved, God is the greatest renovator of all. He's a renovator renovator of lives. Those who are allowing him to do that. I don't care what your past is. I don't care what colossal failure or even sin there has been in your life. God will make a masterpiece of it. You let him do it. The disciples needed renovation. As you recall, they were having that trivial argument about who was the greatest. Jesus showed them that true greatness lies in serving. He he told them that, and then he demonstrated it by washing their feet. But he's not done yet. He gives them this sneak peek behind the curtain, the physical curtain where we can't see to the place where God and Satan reside and carry on business in the spiritual realm. And this will profoundly affect them, particularly Peter, he'll learn that God can take junk and make a masterpiece out of it, but it won't be easy. Now, we looked at the first part of this last week, the first three points. We'll look at three more today. We looked last week at the fact of the profane petition. This is Satan asking to have the disciples so that he could sift them like wheat and demonstrate that their faith wasn't genuine. It's what he wants to do. That's what he's trying to do to all of us. Secondly, the priestly prayer. What saves them and what saves us is Jesus is interceding for us at all times as he interceded for the disciples here. But the interesting thing we saw is he didn't intercede for them and say, please don't let them be subject to the temptation. His prayer was that their faith not fail. The test is what helps break off the rough pieces that need to be taken away so that the masterpiece can finally be revealed. So the prayer is for faith, not for saving from the test. And then we saw last week the prideful pronouncement. Peter's response was, thank you very much, Lord, but I don't need your help. Always stand amazed at Peter, don't you? Thank you very much, but uh, I can do it myself, Lord. In fact, I'll not only save me, I'll help you. Count on me, I'll be my... I'll make my own masterpiece. He's representative of the fact that the only thing that can stop God from doing what he wants to do in our life is us. Our own pride. Our own thought that we know best, that God's commands don't apply to us. Maybe they apply to those first century people, apply to somebody else, not me. I don't need God until I really get in trouble. Prideful pronouncement. So let's look at the rest of this today, tremendously encouraging the predicted peril. 
predicted peril. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me, deny three times that you know me. What Jesus is saying there is, Masterpiece, Peter, let me tell you what you're actually going to do. Before morning, you're going to deny me, you're going to deny that you even know me three times. Not once, three times. It's not going to be a mistake that you can just overlook. This is a little more than a little blip. It's going to be an absolute disaster. Peter's overconfidence will be his downfall. And the key to that is, we saw in the first part in verse 31, Jesus says to him, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded, have you Simon? He knows that Peter's going to be acting in accordance with his old self, his old name, Simon. He's going to be dependent on what he can do. He's confident in his own ability. He's sure of his own commitment. He's certain of his own power. All of which is an absolute, of course, recipe for disaster, but it's the place most of us live most of the time. Consciously or unconsciously. The old song, you know, said, The arm of flesh will fail you. You dare not trust your own. Peter didn't know that yet. He's about to learn it the hard way. So did Abraham. Genesis 12, if you want to turn with me there. Abraham, as you recall, had been called by God. He was told to go a place God would show him, and God showed him Canaan, 500 miles from his home in Ur of the Chaldees. He'd certainly never been there, didn't know anything about it, but God planted him there. And then wasn't there very long, and suddenly there's a famine in the land, and so Abraham decides, I better do something. I think I'll go down to Egypt, understand things are better down there. But he realizes there may be a problem. He's got a beautiful wife. And he's afraid. And so we read this in Genesis 12, verse 11, beginning kind of in the middle of the verse there. He said to Sarah, he said, I know that you are a woman beautiful in appearance. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. So here's my plan. Say that you are my sister which was half true. She was a half-sister. Say that you are my sister. Can't you see him, can't you see him um, rationalizing this in his own mind? She's my sister, right? I mean, I can, this is so me, I'm sorry, it's me. Say you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared for your sake. Abraham needs protection, So what does he do? Turn to God, this God that he's becoming to know? No, he turns to Abraham. He has a plan. This is Abraham trusting Abraham. This is fleshly effort. This is living in the old self. This is being who I was before I came to faith in God or faith in Christ. So how did that work out? Just like always, not so great. Pharaoh, thinking that Abraham was Sarah's brother, paid a huge dowry to take her into his harem. You have to ask yourself, I wonder how manly Abraham was feeling about that time, right? Verse 17, the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? So I took her for my wife. Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. Where did Abraham's fleshly effort get him? It got him in the miserable condition of a highly conflicted coward. It exposed his wife to gross immorality, and it exposed his neighbors to great plagues. So that rather than the blessing that he was called to be in the early part of Genesis 12, he is instead a curse to all of those around him. Beloved, the lesson here is we we dare not trust ourselves. Kill it in terms of this is what I'm trusting in. The the flesh, there's only one way to deal with the flesh, and that is to be brutal with it. 
because it'll take us down every time. This is what God is teaching Abraham here. This is what he's going to teach Peter. We cannot go it alone. There was a doctor, uh, Bronson Ray was his name one time. He was outside of his home. He saw a boy on a scooter uh, going by on the sidewalk, and he watched him going down the street a little ways, and, and the, the boy lost control. He ran into a tree and fell off the scooter and just was laying there unconscious. So Dr. Ray ran over there began to attend to him, and of course a, a crowd began to gather around. And just as he was kind of turning the boy over to try and see what it was really going on, he felt a tap on his shoulder, and a guy, a guy said to him, Sir, would you please, uh, maybe you should move aside for a moment. I'll take it from here. I'm a Boy Scout. I know first aid. Wonderful. That's like a second lieutenant tapping Eisenhower on the shoulder as D-Day's about to start and saying, thanks for getting the stuff together. I'll take it from here, right? That's like Peter telling Jesus, I'll take care of myself and you too. That's like me saying to the Lord, okay, I put 30 hours into this sermon. Surely this will change some lives. That's like you saying, I've got a clever little um, object lesson here. Surely this will get the kids' attention and it will do the job fleshly effort. Should we, let me ask you this, because this is confusing to some of us, should we prepare as best we can? Absolutely. God expects it. It's criminal not to. You should fire me if I get up here and obviously didn't do anything to study this week, right? You should. But if I get up here and think it's going to be my great sermon that's going to change lives, I am drastically mistaken. It's God using whatever giftedness he may have given me and whatever giftedness he may have given you to teach those young people. That's what counts, right? And if we're not praying and committing that to the Lord and giving it to him, we're just doing the arm of flesh in our own strength. You know, we have to commit what we have to the Lord, but he does the painting. Do you see? He does the painting. And all we do when we think we can do this and we count on ourselves to get whatever it is that we're trying to get accomplished is just make him start all over again. I was reading an account of Billy Graham this week, relatively early in his career. He was out in a, in a field with some men praying famous already by this time, but they were praying for whatever crusade was about to come up. And one of the guys, as they were praying, is Billy's turn to pray, and he thought, man, he doesn't sound like he's kneeling on the ground. He sounds like he's laying down. And he opened his eyes, and he looked, and there's Billy Graham prostrate on the ground in his good suit, laying on the ground, face down, praying to God. And as you read accounts, you'll find that over and over, people found Billy Graham praying that way. Why? Because he understood that his dependence couldn't be on his great preaching. His wife regularly reminded him he wasn't that great. Thank God for wives who will do that, right? It was the power of God on his life that was important. The arm of flesh will fail you. Beloved, we are always one step away from spiritual disaster. We are. That's why we hit it so often. We need to be reminded that we are in peril at all times. But now we come to the really good part of this account. There are two things that are going to happen. Peter's going to get a pardon, and he's going to get a payoff. He's going to get a pardon, and he's going to get a payoff. So let's first of all look at the preserving pardon. It's the end of verse, it's in verse 32. Jesus says in the last part of that verse, he says, and when you have turned again, turned again. When you see the term turned in the Bible, it's a synonym for repentance. Turned again, repentance, because that's what repentance is. Repentance is me turning from my own way, turning from dependence on myself, turning from thinking I can do it on my own and turning to God turning away from self 
and turning to God. It's the, the word is used all over the Old Testament. Read through just Zechariah sometime. Turn to me, turn to me, turn to me, turn to me. What's he saying? Repent. And that's what he's saying to Peter here. You need to turn around. Peter will act like the old Simon right through three denials of his Lord. But he won't stay there. Right? He won't stay there. He will turn again. That is so important. None of the promises that I'm going to talk about, none of them that I've talked about already count until we have a heart that is turning again to God. Listen, we will make mistakes. Listen, I'll tell you what, God expects you to make mistakes more than you do. You're going to do it. But the key is to live a life of continuous repentance before God, to be soft-hearted toward Him, to recognize and acknowledge and confess our sins. Peter's going to be the old Simon for a while, but he's not going to stay there. He's going to return from denial to disciple. He's going to turn again. Now, what's interesting here is that there's a contrast, not so much in this passage, in these few verses, but there's a contrast in this whole event because there's another colossal failure that's in the, that's, that's in the picture here, right? Judas. As Jesus speaks this night, there are ten very scared guys around this table, but there are two absolute betrayers. One of them returns to the fold. The other one doesn't. One of them went on to live a life of extreme usefulness in the Lord's service. The other one killed himself. One of them is in heaven today. The other one is not. What's the difference? One thing, repentance. The ability to come to God and acknowledge who we really are and to ask for the grace that's available to anyone who will do that. The difference is repentance. Peter's heart was always repentant. Judas's heart never was. It wasn't their actions that made them different. It was their hearts. Peter got repentance. Could Judas have gotten repentance? Absolutely. Gotten forgiveness? Absolutely. But he wouldn't repent. Isn't it wonderful to know that you're forgiven? Let me tell you, there's no experience in life like knowing that you're forgiven and cleansed. Turn with me to John 21. I want you to see how this happens in Peter's life. John 21. After his resurrection, Jesus found Peter back fishing. Jesus had sent them had, had through the angels, and then, and then himself had told them, I want you to go up to Galilee. I'll meet you up there. I think we often have the feeling that after the resurrection, Jesus was constantly with his disciples. According to the scripture, he really wasn't. He was periodically making appearances. And there was, about, there was at least a week between the time that he saw them down in Judea and the time that he saw them again up in Galilee. And by the time that, that he gets up there, Peter's already decided to go back fishing. And the implication is, in John 21, when he says, I'm going to go fishing, it's a present tense. It's the, the implication is he's going back to his old career. Peter feels like he's blown it. Peter feels like it's all over. I denied my Lord. And even though I've now seen him alive, I don't feel like I can do whatever he's calling me to do. This is where Peter's at. He's gone fishing, and many of his companions have joined him. Some of them were fishermen as well. So they've gone fishing. They have no luck that night. But all of a sudden, as they're coming in the morning, somebody out on shore hollers, Hey, try the other side. So they tried the other side, and they got so many fish, they didn't know what to do with them all, right? The first clue that this was the Lord. So they come ashore. Jesus cooked breakfast for them. Don't you love this? There's no stinging rebuke. There's no, hi, Peter, how you doing? What were you doing around that campfire the other night? I saw you. I know what you did. Confess it. There's none of that going on here. Jesus fixes him breakfast. So gracious. This is 
the heart of God, beloved. It's the heart of God toward Peter. It's the heart of God toward you. Does he know everything bad you've ever done? Absolutely. Is he ready to forgive you the moment you turn to him? Turn again. I'll fix you breakfast. Gracious meal for a hungry fisherman. But he finally gets down to business in verse 15. Beautiful passage. One of the most beautiful in all the world. Look what he says. Simon. He addresses him as Simon, the old Peter. The old fleshly Peter. Do you love me? Agape. The highest form of selfless love. You, you've all heard the Greek language has four, four words for this. We, well, we have one. And this is the form that is, has to do with, with the will, the desire, the, the, the will, the purpose to love somebody, despite whether they're good or bad or indifferent. I'm going to love this person. Jesus says, do you love me like that? Three times he asked Peter, do you love me? One for each denial, of course. First two times, Jesus says, do you agape me? Do you love me in that way? And Peter answers, yes, I love you, phileo. Not agape. I love you with a brotherly affection. I am personally drawn to you and attracted to you. This is not the highest form of love, but it's the only one that Peter could honestly say that he had. He had never ceased to love Jesus that way, but he certainly had proven he didn't love him in the selfless way that Jesus loved him. And in essence, with his answer, he's confessing his guilt. Peter, do you agape me? Yes, Lord, I, I I, I phileo you. So beautifully, the third time, Jesus asks, Simon, do you love me? Phileo. Phileo. Do you have the brotherly affection for me that you say you do? What's Jesus doing? Jesus is saying to Peter, Peter, Thank you for your confession. Here's what I want you to know. I'll meet you where you are. You're at phileo today. That's where I'll meet you. Do you phileo me? But I'll tell you this, Peter. The day is going to come when you will be at agape. The day is going to come when you will selflessly give your life in crucifixion just like is going to happen to me. Only you will say, I'm not worthy to be crucified right side up like my Lord is. I want to be crucified upside down. The day's going to come. But I'll start with you where you are. Jesus will meet you where you are, beloved. And then he will say to you, go and feed my sheep. Go and be involved. Find the ministry and find the mission that I have for your life and get involved in it. That's what I want you to do. What restoration, what forgiveness, what a God. There's a young man named Howard Cadle, C-A-D-L-E. Back in the early days of the 20th century, he had a Christian mom, but he had an alcoholic father. And, and his father was the, was the whole influence on his life. By the time he was 12 years old, he already had a severe drinking problem. He was already so involved in gambling that the, that the Midwest crime syndicate that was close to his home had gotten their hooks in him. And his mother knew all of this and there wasn't anything she could do about it. But she said to him, she said, Howard, here's what I want you to know. I want you to remember wherever you are, whatever you're doing, at 8 o'clock every night, I will be kneeling by your, by your bed and asking God to protect you and to save you. That's what I'll be doing. I want you to know that. Well, for years, it seemed like there was no answer to those prayers. They were to no avail. Till one night in a drunken rage, Howard Cadle pulled a gun on another man in a, in a drunken rage, and he pulled the trigger. Only the gun failed to fire. Somebody knocked it out of his hand, and as he looked to see where the gun was going, he noticed a clock on the wall, 8 o'clock. His heart was stirred by that, but he continued on in his ways for a while, but that couldn't, couldn't get that out of his mind. It wasn't long before he had a break in his health. He went to the doctor. The doctor said, you have six months to live. So he returned home. 
He said, Mother, I know I've broken your heart. I'd like to be saved, but I have sinned too much. I've done too much. God could never save me. He would never want somebody like me. What would you say to someone like that? His mother quoted Isaiah 118. Come now. Let's reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, as bad as they could possibly be, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. His mother told him, there's no sin too great that God can't forgive you. Where did you ever get that idea? All the things that you think are bad aren't even the worst thing you've done. He said, What's the, what do you mean? She said, the worst thing you've done is you've nailed Jesus to the cross. Your sins put him there. You've killed the Son of God. But he let you do that for the reason that he wants to save you. He will forgive you. All you need to do is ask. Howard Cato came to faith in Christ. He turned from his criminal ways to trying to make money honestly. He was one of those guys that everything he touched turned to gold. Pretty soon he had more money than he knew what to do with, so he became a major financier of the Gypsy Smith evangelistic crusades. And then he became one of the first radio evangelists himself over WLW in Cincinnati. He said this toward the end of his life. He said, until Jesus calls me home, I shall preach the same gospel that caused my sainted mother to pray for me. And beloved, it's the same gospel that works today. If you've never come by faith to Christ, confessed your sins, accepted him as your Savior, today's your day. No one is too bad enough not to be able to have salvation, and no one is too good enough not to need it. Today's your day to come by faith to Christ. If you are a Christian, but you've somehow managed to stray, you've denied him, like Peter's going to do by the way that you have been living, forgiveness can be yours. You haven't lost your salvation. You can't lose your salvation, but you have certainly lost your way. Just like Peter's going to do, turn again. Turn again. There's pardon. There's pardon. There's pardon available because of the blood of Jesus. And then sixthly, the providential payoff. Providential payoff. This is, this is so powerful. I want you to listen carefully to this. God never wastes anything in our lives. Never wastes anything in the life of a repentant heart. Nothing, not even sin. Now listen, it'd be better if you didn't sin. Sin always brings consequences. But God will even use the sin in your life that's been there to make a masterpiece of a repentant heart. Two ways this is shown in this passage. I want you to see them. They're very important. First of all, notice in verse 31, Jesus says, Simon, Simon. That's about the same as saying danger, warning. You're about to live in your own fleshly effort. You're about to do this with no dependence on me. You think you can do it on your own. The red flag should be going off. Simon, you're about to revert your old self, and it isn't going to be pretty. Simon. But look at verse 34. I tell you, Peter. I tell you, Peter. The rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times that you knew me. Why would he say, when he's telling him how bad it's going to be, why would he call him Peter? Rock. Peter. As best I can tell, it's one of two times in the Gospels that Jesus calls him Peter, even though he's the one who gave him that name. Peter. Rock. What's he doing? Listen, here's what he's doing, beloved. Catch this. He is addressing him as the masterpiece he will become instead of the mess that he is. That's important. 
He's addressing him as the masterpiece that he will become instead of the mess that he is. That's the grace of God. Jesus did the same thing with Gideon. See, how is that possible? Gideon lived 1,300 years before Jesus was ever born. Well, let me show you. It's in Jude, Judges, uh, uh, Judges chapter 6. Jason read part of it for us this morning. So let's turn there. Judges chapter 6. Jesus does the same thing with Gideon. G you know, the, the, the Israelites have been, have been in trouble with the Midianites. You know, another tribal group around. And, and they were being persecuted because the Midianites were stronger than them. And they had cried out to God. That they needed, this, was the, this is the way Judges goes, right? Seven cycles of the same thing. Being right with God, sinning, going into idolatry, crying out to God, God sending a judge along that, 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 that rescues them, and then they go through the same old cycle again. And here they are in the middle of one of these, and God comes to Gideon. And Gideon, Gideon met Jesus. You say, where do you see that? There's no Jesus until the New Testament. Judges 6, verse 12. Judges 6, verse 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him. Angel of the Lord. It's a special phrase. It's used throughout the New Testament several times. It means a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus, meaning before he was born and, and took on a physical body permanently, Jesus occasionally appeared in a physical body in the Old Testament times. Genesis 17 and 18, when he appeared to Abraham and several other times. Angel of the Lord is a synonym for Jesus before he became a man permanently. Gideon is seeing Jesus. Isn't that amazing? In the Old Testament. So here he is. The angel of the Lord appeared to him. Who's the angel of the Lord? It's Jesus. The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Mighty man of valor? You remember what Gideon, Gideon says... Whoa, 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 hang on. I, I am the weakest person in the weakest family, in the weakest clan, in the weakest tribe of Israel. I'm the weakest of the weak. Mighty man of valor? The Lord commanded him to offer a sacrifice, so he did. He did it at night because he was afraid of his own family. You can read the account. It took him not once, but twice to experiment with this fleece. You know, I want it to be dry if there's dew on the ground. I want it to be wet if there's no dew on the ground before he would actually believe that God was actually calling him. Mighty man of valor? I don't think so. So why does Jesus call him that? Because Jesus is seeing what he's making of, of him rather than what he is starting with. Jesus is seeing the masterpiece that he's going to be instead of the mess that he is. Mighty man of valor. You're going to fail miserably, Peter. You're not ready yet. But I've got your back. I see you as the rock you will become and not just as the Simon that you are. Aren't you glad Jesus sees you for what you will be, not for what you are? Aren't you glad for that? I'm glad for that. What grace. There's a payoff coming for true believers. Jesus calling him Peter certainly hints at that. But there's a direct statement of this in the second place in verse 32. Back in uh, Luke. You'll have to get back in Luke 22. In verse 32 of Luke 22, Jesus says, middle of the verse, and when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. When you've turned again, strengthen your brothers. So track with me now. Jesus is saying, you're going to fail. I know that. But you're going to repent. I know that. I know your heart. And guess what? I'm going to use your failure so you can carry out your mission. I'm going to use your failure so you can strengthen your brothers. Is that gracious of God or what? God wastes nothing. He will use your 
strengths and, and your weaknesses. He will use your joys and your sorrows. He will use your successes and your failures. That should be empowering, beloved. Because we got a lot of all of them, right? But God will use them all. When he finds a repentant heart, that's all it takes. He'll use our successes to inspire and to encourage others. He'll use our hardships to speak comfort to others in the same situation. That's basically what he says in Hebrews 12. He'll use our sin to encourage others to keep them from similar failure and to demonstrate the grace of God. I promise you, you don't need to know the details, but I stand before you as a, as an, as a, as a primary token of the grace of God. No wasted parts, no throwaway experience, experiences, no expendable events in our lives. When repentance is at the core of it, God uses it all. God used the sin and adultery of David to ultimate good. This is what frustrates Satan. He's the most frustrated individual in history. He gets you to do wrong, and then God turns it for good. He gets them to crucify Jesus, and then God turns it into the whole means of redemption, right? And he used, he used the sin of adultery and murder in David's life. It would have been better for David if he'd never done that, right? There were severe consequences. David paid for him for the rest of his life. I'm not saying there are no consequences, but I'm saying God uses those things. How did he use it in the life of David? He put it in the Bible. He put it in the Bible to show us that however glamorous sin may look and however good it may feel, it has severe consequences. So we know that going in. And Hebrews, the writer, tells us there's pleasure in sin for a little while. It doesn't last very long. David's life is representative of that. But I'll tell you what else David's life is. It's been one of the greatest things in my life, and I hope it will be in yours. David's life is a continuous reminder that however bad the sin, God will forgive it. However awful, he committed adultery. He killed the husband. He took the wife. And so we get, eventually we get Psalm, and, and he was so bad, he, didn't, he wouldn't confess. It took a year before Nathan the prophet came and a little illustration to get him to realize he was the guy. And in Psalm 32 and Psalm 51, we have two psalms of his confession before God. And then you know what God did. God took, took the first son that he had through Bathsheba and took him to heaven. But he took the second one, Solomon, and he, and he became the one through whom the Messiah came. Now, David had a bunch of other wives. It could have been the mother of the one who was going to be the the one that would be the mother of Jesus, instead he used Bathsheba. What in the world is that about? That's about grace. And so you'll find Bathsheba listed in the genealogy of Christ in Matthew chapter 1. Amazing grace. God doesn't waste anything. God took the sin of fighting and of disagreement that happened between Paul and Barnabas and created two mission teams instead of one. There's nothing in our lives, beloved, that God will not use if we live a humble, repentant life. And if you want to keep going on your own, you, then, you, then, you, then you're on your own. If you will repent and live that way, God will turn it all to good. Listen, you will not be the first exception to this rule. You will just be part of a long line of failed people that God has turned into masterpieces. His providential payoff is still in effect as he continues to create masterpieces of good works out of the trash bins of failure. That's who we are. Ephesians 6.10. Paul says, finally, be strong. In the Lord. Not in yourself. Be strong in the Lord. And in the strength of his might. His might. Depended on him. Peter tried to be strong in Simon's might and it didn't work out so well. But he learned that God is ready to pick up the pieces as soon as we turn again. Reminds me of the woman who went down and she ordered a birth certificate. She needed, you know, she'd lost hers. She needed to get one for some reason. She ordered it. It came, and she showed up the next day at the, at the office, mad as can be. 
She says, you guys have sent this birth certificate. It's all filled out wrong. And the clerk says, What's, what seems to be the problem? She says, you put my maiden name on it. Think about it. She didn't apparently want to be her old self anymore. That's the way we need to live. I don't want to be the old Dave. I don't want you to be the old whoever you are. More importantly, God wants us to be who we are in Christ. Peter couldn't change the fact that he was born Simon, but he didn't have to live there. As he turned again, Jesus created a masterpiece named Peter. And he'll create a masterpiece of us as well. I'm looking forward to watching it, aren't you? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your promises. We thank you for your grace. You overwhelm us. You overwhelm us. What we could never deserve, you freely give us. If we will just turn again and again and again and again and however many times it takes. Help us to do that. There are some here this morning, Father, who have made a mess of things, some perhaps long ago, some perhaps a few years ago, a few months ago, some, some less last week. Mess, really messed it up. I don't know what it is. I just know that it happens. I pray this morning, Father, that they will just turn again. Give it to you. See what you can do with junk and what a masterpiece you can make out of it. We will let you. So may we let you. In the name of our Lord Jesus, I pray. Amen.